Hey, hi, hello, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Jess and welcome to part two of this week's book community where I try to keep you abreast of the goings on in the bookish community, change of scenery. I hope it's okay. I'm also trying to use lighting because downstairs light isn't that great, but we're down here for internet reasons. Although I feel like this light really illuminate, like you can really tell um, how dark my eyes are, but oh well, I'm tired. What can you do? If you noticed from the last time I was downstairs, I don't know if you remember, Actually, there might've been a Christmas tree. Anyway, we got shelves downstairs. And so this is my one little shelf that I've started building. I'm primarily trying to have like nonfiction and historical fiction downstairs. So this is my little shelf here and it will continue to grow. Nigel, please. But for now you just get this. So in a video, maybe two weeks ago, I spoke about the book Once More with Chutzpah by Haley Neal. So the book is a YA debut about a teen who grapples with questions of her Jewish identity, mental health, and sexuality on an unforgettable trip to Israel. And the cover reveal for this book brought up things that were said last year when the book was announced from a lot of people expressing disappointment um, and being upset that this book was going forward with being published because a lot of people, especially people from Palestine or Palestinian American people had voiced um, their, their opinions on this book and the thoughts of why it could be harmful. And so I spoke about that. I read comments from people who were opposed to this book. Now I'm obviously, I'm, I'm neither Palestinian and I'm not Jewish. So I am just trying to present this information. I don't have a right to comment on what is, what is right or not, or if it should be published or not. So there were a lot of comments under that video from various people from various backgrounds giving their opinions. And if you saw that I didn't reply, it's like, I don't, I didn't feel like I had the place to reply there. So I did receive an email from a subscriber. It was a very kind email and I'm not going to say who it was but they were just giving me their opinion um, on the whole situation so i wanted to read that email they did give me permission to share it and i just wanted to share a different perspective so they said hi jess i love your channel it's a bright spot in my week whenever you release a new video and your dog is freaking adorable thank you if you want to share any of my below letter please feel free to do so but please keep it anonymous if you don't want to share it that is cool too i appreciate your time and knowing i've said something is enough I want to address something regarding Once More with Huspa as you discuss the controversy behind it on your book community video on February 16th. You rightly center the Palestinian voices issuing their complaints. I want to say something here because I feel this is more nuanced than white woman ruins everything, which is kind of where this feels like it could be going because the book is about an American Jew. I'm a white Jewish American woman and I want to speak to the experience of being a Jew and the issues raised by this current controversy, especially as acts of anti-Semitism in the US are at a high. I have no association with the book. I'd like to speak generally about my experience as a Jewish person regarding Jewish rep in books and the Israel-Palestine question. When I was growing up, the only place I saw myself in a book was either as a Holocaust victim or somewhat in Are You There God is Me Margaret. Margaret was half Jewish and her celebrating Christmas made her feel alien to me. And even now, while there are more books about Jewish characters, the Jewish experience in literature has been mainly reduced to our status as victims, or if not victims, goofy side characters who say weird words like svel or svitz or plots. Basically, stories written by Jewish authors about the modern Jew Jewish experience are seldom published. These stories deserve an own voices hashtag. They seldom get it because in part, of vicious stereotypes about how Jews control the media. There's also a sort of model minority situation where because a lot of people in publishing are Jewish, maybe they think we have enough rep. So we are let, left out of pitch events, diverse voices, conversations, etc. This book is own voices for ace rep, but also for Jewish rep. That's important and I think worth mentioning. Second, Jews are also often asked to speak on, on issues of Israel, Palestine and be louder than anyone else about it and to make the perfect comment. It's hard and in my experience, people ask me to pick a side and get angry if I don't. If we say we are anti-Israel, we are told we are bad Jews or subjected to anti-Semitic comments about how don't all Jews feel loyalty to Israel? Look up dual loyalty for Jews if you wanna get more into that stereotype. If we say we are pro-Israel, we are told we are heartless colonizers who don't understand anyone's plight and often issues of all Jews being rich or having extra power, etc. Other ugly stereotypes get dragged into it. I understand why the author did not comment. It fucking sucks to be Jewish and asked to talk about Israel 
about someone who clearly has a bone to pick with you before they even hear your opinion. It sucks to be Jewish and not Israeli and be expected to be an expert in global politics. It sucks to be asked to be an expert on a very long standing and ugly conflict that is nuanced for a lot of Jews in the sense that there is literally no other place in the world where we can go and not be the minority. There's a lot of, I want Israel to succeed and Israel is 100% wrong sitting in all of us, which is a classic Jewish thing, ask two Jews, get three opinions. That's too much to explain over the internet. TLDR, there is need for Jewish books. This issue, from what I can tell as an outsider, isn't about an ignorant white woman stomping around on other people's cultures. It's about a Jewish woman exploring an important formative time in her life that happened to take place in the state of Israel during a program that allows us to connect to those roots and make friendship with other Jews as young adults when we might be away from an active Jewish community for the first times in our lives. I'm not saying birthright is perfect. I'm saying that young Jews deserve stories that represent them getting to live happy, joyful lives. We should be mindful of what we put in books. Our minority status does not exempt us from being good, conscientious people. And it seems like the author is being mindful. We'll see when the book is released. But also maybe the story of Palestinian occupation isn't hers to tell. Asking Jews to comment on Israel and Palestine politics is not as simple as non-Jews might think because it leads to ugly anti-Semitic stereotypes getting thrown at us no matter how we answer. Additionally, those questions are often based in those stereotypes. Three, and finally, there needs to be more Palestinian rep in books. So authors who have lived those experience can really bring to light what's happening there without having to rely on this one book to present a nuanced perspective. This one book by an author who doesn't have that experience. I think that's the issue underneath this all. Thanks for reading this huge email. I appreciate, I, I appreciate you. Let me know if you have any questions. And so I emailed her back and uh, the response was, I can't speak for all Jewish people, but I think it was right of you to bring the topic up and center Palestinian voices. I personally never thought critically about birthright in the context of how Palestinians view the program. I didn't take a birthright trip for various reasons, though I wish I had. And this is a great discussion to have and something that should be brought to the forefront because the topic is fraught and complex. We should be talking about it. I should examine my privilege as a Jewish person when it comes to Israel, just as I try to examine my privilege Privilege as a white person living in the US while also trying to educate non-Jews on all the baggage I have regarding being Jewish and being asked to speak about Israel and be right all the time but any pain on this topic as you brought it up in my opinion is a good pain a growing pain I hope that this conversation at large ultimately doesn't cancel once more with chutzpah and I'm an optimist and believe that until I see evidence to the contrary the author is doing the work to make her story more conscientious but brings more visibility to the great need for literature that centers Palestinians and the Palestinian experience and that publishing actually takes notes and makes an effort to seek out and publish work by Palestinian authors. So I know that was a really, that was really long, but I just thought that was important to share because that's coming from someone who is Jewish, uh, a Jewish American perspective. And so I know there were some comments about like, this is just from the blurb, people are getting upset, they haven't read the book. You know, which is fair, the book isn't out. And I thought that also was an excellent point about how the majority of times when she sees herself in the book, when there's like Jewish representation, is either as a victim, you know, like in a historical fiction or a, about the Holocaust, or as a funny side character. So I understand people who are Jewish, and then there is also Ace Rep that could be really excited about this story. So. Yeah, I'm not commenting whether it's right or not for the book to be published. I just wanted to share that other opinion. And yeah, I guess we'll see when it comes out later in the year. So about a week ago, I was seeing tweets from authors about expectations really from like readers of how open and available they should be on the internet. And I don't know what started it, but a lot of authors like chimed in, giving their personal opinions, tips on how they balance, you know, if they use social media, what they do. And so Case and Calendar also wrote a piece about it. And so I'm gonna read some of it. I won't read the whole thing because it's kind of long, but I will link it down below and then read some of the author's tweets. So again, I'm not sure how this started, but I just thought it was a really interesting interesting conversation as a reader and user of twitter i do follow some authors so this is Kaysen's 
Peace. So is it, there's a conversation making the rounds on social media about author expectations for engagement. I definitely have some thoughts. So I've mentioned a few times now that publishing controls the market. The industry decides which books will be the best selling novels with publishers alerting the New York Times, which titles they would like to be considered for the list. And with the New York Times list also taking marketing budgets into consideration. Basically, was the book everywhere you turned? Yes. That ups the book's chances. These books are generally chosen to be big based on data, which similar books have done well and hit the list in the past, as well as what the publisher slash imprints list looks like. Is it overcrowded or is there enough room to pick and choose several titles to let them all shine? There are marketing and publicity meetings where people within the industry choose titles Choose which titles will be picked as book for certain ranks, which books will be the best sellers, mid-listers, and the let's say quiet titles. I say this all because I've realized with some space from social media that I struggle with the gaslighting of some of the industry. There's an expectation by many that authors give more of themselves to come up with their own marketing schemes, to search for as many opportunities to publicize themselves and their books as possible. There's an unspoken and sometimes spoken suggestion from publishing companies and professionals that if the book doesn't do well as the author might have hoped, then it's actually the author's fault. They should have found a street team, fans paid to hype the book up online in a way that seems organic and natural, created their own pre-order campaigns, paying for swag, artists to draw out their characters, etc. pitched themselves to different media outlets, learned Photoshop to create graphics, paid someone to create a book trailer, hyped themselves up in a constant competition for attention online, the list goes on and on. The gaslighting is this, the publishing companies and industry professionals know that the authors don't actually control how well their book is going to do. They put that responsibility on the authors when the responsibility is really meant to be on the publishing companies. That's why we go with traditional publishing, isn't it? That's why so many of us don't self publish. We don't have the necessary marketing skills. I certainly don't anyway. The marketing slash publicity is ultimately publishing's responsibility. The publishing companies have their budgets and they spend those limited budgets on the books they expect will earn back a specific amount of money. Money. Authors really don't need to do anything to find that financial success. Case study A. Suzanne Collins. Where? Nowhere, that's where. She doesn't do any publicity or marketing from what I can see. Yet the Hunger Games series is, well, you already know. Clearly, there isn't actually a correlation between authors needing to do marketing and publicity and a book's financial success. A major part of this entire issue is the imbalance in power. There are so many authors being published these days that publishing with this general lack of transparency is in a position where they're able to suggest we're lucky that we publish you when really this is a fair business exchange where authors have created products that are making publishing companies money. Case study B, a certain major author recently described as plucked from obscurity. She was lucky to be published, right? If even this major author is considered lucky by majority white people in the industry, I'm afraid to think of where that leaves everyone else. This is certainly harder on marginalized people. Back to that unhealthy statement I heard while working in publishing, it helps that a person is attractive. What does attractive mean? Is my brown skin with its dark spots gonna make the cut? I'm a non-binary demi boy, but pretty femme. Do people expect me to wear makeup because they view me as feminine? Do I need to spend my money on expensive clothes to be considered attractive and acceptable? What about my kinky hair, which takes an incredibly long time and a lot of effort to make presentable to white people, really? With every photo I take and every video I post, what about my ADHD, which makes it difficult and exhausting to speak to neurotypical standards? Thinking not only about what I have to prepare to say, but how to suppress myself and my true instincts. And what about my anxiety too? I actually love events and I love speaking to people and especially love having the chance to hear from young readers, but a single event can take me days to recover from, even virtually and from the comfort of my home. There was a time when I thought that these events were my job and I was doing them several times a week, sometimes every single day. This on top of trying to figure out how to get more eyes on my titles and me on social media. I was exhausted, emotionally and energetically sapped. That's days away from my actual job, writing. I think social media can be amazing for making genuine connections. Space Away has given me time to reflect and unpack which aspects of social media have been unhealthy for me, including authors' general cultural inability to set boundaries. Yes, I do think that social media and the way authors are treated, dehumanized for the sake of capitalism and entertainment constantly, is traumatizing. Social media is so complicated. I come back hesitantly, only to see a conversation like this making the rounds, but it also feels hopeful that so many other authors are speaking out. Good morning from Raggedy editing Jessica and not helpful Nigel, but I forgot to mention, so I just thought that was an interesting uh, perspective, especially about traditional publishing and the expectation that is put on authors when, like Kaysen said, they are the ones with the budgeting, with the teams that are supposed to promote books. And I just think it's interesting 
that they decide which ones that are going to be bestsellers or which ones are going to put their effort into and then they ignore other books or put less effort into other books but then make the authors feel like it was their fault their book didn't do successfully and obviously we see this and we see the budgets that publishing companies put into big books um by certain authors and neglect other ones so mm publishing's a mess so then like i said i saw other authors chiming into the conversation i saw namina forna the author of the gilded ones ask established authors what boundaries did you set when you became published what do we newbies need to look out for please be real uh clarabelle ortega said in terms of social media i closed my dms everywhere which was key i also set my notifications for people who follow me and i follow only because it gets very overwhelming on here and people are mad for no reason all the time. Lastly, disabled tagging on Instagram. That is probably a really good idea. Karen Strong said, I've learned that boundaries are so important. I have closed DMs and I try to keep public combos to books, fiction crafts, supporting other authors, etc. Although I sometimes go off script, LOL. We need to remember we're here for the books. Author brands can be a slippery slope. <laughs> so true. And this seems to be a general sentiment. Dahlia Adler said, I keep my Twitter DMs closed, my kids' names off any public accounts, and I don't publicly discuss where I work. I try to be fairly vague about where I live. I finally got a PO box, not even so much to get mail as to use for a return address when I do giveaways. Rebecca Kwong said, healthy and respectful boundaries with reviewers I think is critical. Sometimes they love your work and it's fun to gush about it. Sometimes they don't and you should leave them alone. And better yet, don't go watching or reading bad reviews. Let everyone do their job. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. Hallelujah. Again, a lot of keep your Twitter DMs closed. Zoraida Cordova said, I do interact heavily on socials, but I also remind myself that no one is entitled to my time. I updated my contact page and reroute people there. I love that. Not entitled to my time. Aiden Thomas added, my Twitter DMs are closed. I don't respond to DM requests on IG. I don't have notification badges turned for social media. And I don't have notification turned on for folks who don't follow me slash don't have a verified email address for their account. It makes it less likely for trolls to contact me and also keeps me from getting overwhelmed by social media. All seems very smart. I'm not even an author and I have my social media notifications turned off. It's too much, it stresses me out and so no thank you. But yeah, it just keeps going on. It seems like it's a common theme to keep your Twitter DMs closed, to keep your personal life off of your author account, um, like your family, obviously your address, your personal email. Bridget Kimmerer posted, an author doesn't respond to your message or if they don't respond to a follow-up message, please don't take it personally. There are only so many hours in the day and we all get a lot of emails slash DMs. Please do not take it upon yourself to find the author's private email. This is so unsettling and uncalled for. When you buy a book, you have bought a book, not a right to someone's personal time. If an author doesn't respond, there could be a million reasons why and none of those reasons are anything personal against the emailer. So what the fuck? Who does that? I don't even know how, how you do that. The people on the internet are savvy in not great ways. But that is really scary because especially like doxing when they can find people's address and stuff, that shit that's it's too much so i thought that was just a really interesting conversation that was going on with authors on twitter and we all have seen that twitter has been wonderful and terrible at the same times for like the author reader relationship obviously a lot of people have exposed themselves as trash human beings on twitter and then some other people maybe they're not like wholly terrible but they make really dumb comments or you know sh just share dumb opinions that they have so twitter can be a really dangerous landscape especially when you are following a musician an actor an author that you admire and then you see a different side of them so i just thought that was interesting to share in case you know you are dming an author and wondering why you're not getting a response or you're an author yourself and wondering what kind of boundaries you should set Thought that was an interesting conversation. And yes, please don't look up people's personal emails. No, ew. Also, no one, no one on social media, unless it's a company that you are messaging like their helpline, no one on social media owes you a response in most cases. I'm not gonna say never, but you know, if you your Dyson vacuum didn't show up and you're DMing Dyson help, that's different. 
or your glasses USA glasses didn't or show up and you ordered them in November, that's different than, you know, DMing somebody and always expecting a response. Just keep that in mind. So lastly for today, I wanted to talk about the conversation going on about own voices. So this, I can't remember when this started, but it did start as a hashtag to basically like identify when the story, the perspective in the story were also lived experience by the author. So if I wrote a story about a black woman, that would be own voices because I'm a black woman, you know, but if it's a white author writing a story about a black woman, that's not own voices. Anywho, lately it's been kind of being used in publishing in a not great way. What I meant to say is this came up and was on my timeline on Twitter because there's an author who has a story featuring, featuring a bisexual character. And when trying to uh, get the book published, editors were questioning how he wrote a story with a bisexual character if he wasn't bisexual himself which forced him to come out sooner than he was ready so i'm going to read the letter that they shared and this goes back to i mean several months ago when becky albertalli felt like she had to come out and this also goes into people and their trauma. Like when Lee Bardugo wrote Ninth House and people were like, why are you writing this book with all these like trigger warnings and this content? And it's really like a conversation of someone shouldn't have to divulge or share their past or their trauma for you to say, okay, it's fine for you to write this book. It also happened with the author of My Vanessa. So anyway, I'm gonna read this. Again, I'm gonna read parts of the letter and I'll link the full thing in the description if you wanna read all of it. For those unfamiliar with me, you've reached the blog of Rod Polito. Please take off your shoes before entering. I am Filipino American, an aspiring white author, a proud father, and happily married husband of 20 years to an amazing, lovely wife. Oh yeah, I'm also bisexual. Welcome to my coming out party. In lieu of gifts, please donate to an LGBTQ plus nonprofit of your choice. So how did I arrive here? Let's rewind five years. And so he references February 2016 during an interview with Manny Pacquiao, who is a legendary boxer. He made homophobic statements saying that queer people were worse than animals. Um, his comments obviously set off a firestorm of controversy and divided the Filipino community worldwide. He was a longtime Pacquiao fan, so he was obviously angered by his ignorance and felt betrayed. Uh, Pacquiao was his hero, but he could no longer support him. And so before this incident, he was already thinking of a story that he wanted to write. And it was about a bully teenager who learns to defend himself by studying boxing matches of Manny Pacquiao. So he set it aside for that moment. Then Pacquiao made his comments and he realized his story would be very important and timely, especially with a queer protagonist. So he imagined the book being about a bullied gay teen who learns to fight because of Pacquiao, then to be shattered because his hero is homophobic. So when he was thinking of writing this story, own voices in publishing had begun to address issues involving authenticity and underrepresented points of view. Own voices serves to promote stories written by authors with the same marginalized background as their lead characters. I was a big proponent of own voices, but I knew that very few Filipino American authors were breaking into the industry, straight or queer. If I didn't take it upon myself to write this very Phil Am story, who would? So he ended up writing the story about a pair of comic book geeks protagonist, the excitement and innocence of finding your first love and how unchecked bigotry can lead to violence, themes that intimately spoke to my life experiences and said to my astonishment, I started to have thoughts and memories that forced me to struggle with my own sexual identity. I recalled awkward boy crushes I'd had when I was younger and romantic infatuation was with athletes that I'd long ago forgotten. So he was excited yet shaken by these thoughts. So obviously he had met and started dating his future wife in ninth grade. She's the only person I've been in love with in our relationship is the only serious one that he'd been in. So he obviously was weren't wondering what these things would mean for his marriage, but he decided that it wasn't gonna change much. He was in love with his wife as deeply as he'd ever been. So he was asking like, so he was asking himself, so am I bi? Does that mean I'm in the closet? Um, he wasn't sure, but continued writing. So he finished the story uh, titled Chasing Pacquiao. We found a literary agent. In the second round, we found a hope in a young editor who was excited about the book. And then, so they came back, said after reading the new draft, the editor was impressed with the changes and wanted to discuss my project in more detail. 
So the day before her staff meeting, he and the editor chatted on the phone to get to know each other better um, and discuss the possibility of her representing his project. So they obviously were sharing their pandemic stories and talking about the manuscript and inspiration and felt like they were connecting. And she asked about his home life. So he told her about his wife, how they're high school sweethearts, how they have a child together. And she replied, oh, I didn't realize you weren't queer. Her tone had shifted from engaged to uncertain. I began to worry. She expressed concerns that the story wasn't truly own voices because of my sexuality. I wanted to reply, it is own voices because not only am I Filipino, but I'm probably bisexual. I wanted to confess to her about my boyhood crushes and all the times the playground bully had tormented me with a gay slur. How those experiences informed my writing and made it true and real, but how could I? I was still in the process of re-evaluating re-evaluating my sexuality. I hadn't even broached those very personal issues with my wife. How could I reveal them to a stranger? Even if I did admit my feelings, it would only appear as a desperate stab at credibility. So I kept my thoughts private and we cut our talk short. So that editor ended up passing on the story. He said he fell into a depression and I guess then later on during an animated discussion about my manuscript, my wife jokingly said, maybe you're bisexual, sweetie. That one throwaway comment led to some lengthy, heartfelt, sometimes awkward discussions with her about everything I've been processing for the past two years. With the help of my wife and another dear friend, I was able to come to terms with being bi. I came out to my family, my agent, and now I'm coming out to you who are reading this. Okay, if you want, send me guess. <laughs> and so, he goes on to mention own voices movement has done such good within publishing obviously more authors of color and lgbtq plus writers are getting their books into the hands of readers who are starved to see themselves on page but there is also a rarely talked about downside closeted writers are getting passed over for publication and are being pressured to come out before they're truly ready marginalized authors with fresh vibrant voices are being shunted aside all in the name of a hashtag that was supposed to help them get their stories told in the first place who has the right to tell a particular story and who gets to decide this these are questions that need discussing, although the answers are rarely as clear cut as publishing's gatekeepers, the majority of who are straight and white tend to make them. And Rin Shipeko had a thread about, I am no longer using own voices for my books and I encourage others to do the same. Originally conceived to celebrate us, it's now instead used by publishers as a cudgel to deny by POC authors book deals, forcing them to come out to defend the truths in their book. First, that agent who wants to use your identity as a brand, saying you won't get book deals if you don't come out, so just do it on purpose. Then publishers who rejected a Phil M author, not because they didn't like his book, but because he his book is queer and he isn't out. We are fucking tired of this. I am the spiteful sort, and the only reason I am trying not to release names is because I'm not directly involved in this, and it will likely harm those that are. I don't think a new hashtag will fix this. Changing publishing attitudes and calling out the specific editors and publishers who do this next time are the only correct fixes. As an aside, the original creator of this hashtag is the sweetest person. Um, do not blow this back on them, please, because I will bully y'all. Y'all know me. I wanted to mention these tweets from Justina Ireland as well. Agents are tweeting about how problematic the own voices designation is and while I hate it as well, let's not forget that one, some of these agents repped book disasters that led to the creation of this and two, own voices was originally for readers because publishing is so messy. Publishing has a goldfish memory. It's tempting to pretend like these things popped up organically, but the own voices designation was created to let readers know that a book was written by someone from that marginalized group with the hope of elevating marginalized writers. But agents and editors turned own voices into a litmus test of authenticity instead. And now it's become another gatekeeping tool used by the same gatekeepers it was meant to circumvent. Anyway, grandma has to go write a book. Just remember that publishing, like every other for-profit enterprise, is more concerned about making a book than your emotional health and well-being, and you'll be fine. If the lighting changed or the positioning changed, sorry, I almost knocked over this whole tripod. But anyway, it seems to be becoming a pattern that people are having to speak about past trauma or and or come out sooner than they were planning to in order to prove um, that they, you know, had the right to write this story. And so I don't know what the answer is because then there's also the conversation of uh, that was in a video a few months ago, like should non-queer people write queer stories and should white authors write by POC stories? So it, mm, yeah, that's difficult, but that's just really sad that it own voices started out so positive and now of course publishing has taken it and manipulated it and made it something negative. Don't you love it? It's really like we just learn more and more about publishing every week and it just, 
never seems to be great. Yikes. Okay. That wasn't even it, but that's all I can handle in one sitting. I have really bad cramps because I'm on my period. I mean, that's just real life. <laughs> so this is all you get. Also, most of you know, I'm, um, I live in Sicily and there is an active volcano here. Her name is Mount Etna and she's very moody. Um, usually she erupts, you know, occasionally a little bit, but she has been erupting a lot lately. And there's just like a lot of ash everywhere and it's like been getting in my eye and it's like all over my floor and outside and I'm very annoyed. And I'm like, girl, please do not Pompeii us, okay? I don't have time for that. I do not want to die here. Please, girl. But always, I thank you for watching these videos and I would just like to say that I am not the end all be all resource. I try to make these videos for topics that I see a lot of people talking about to try to you know, have a general place that you can come and get information, but I don't see everything, I don't have access to everything. I know there was some discussion in the comments about additional stuff that was happening with Sarah J Mass fans on TikTok. And like I said, I don't have TikTok. I really don't wanna get that app. Um, so I didn't see that and apparently the creator with whom that drama was surrounding either deleted their account or got it removed, but there was some nasty, I guess, Sarah J Mass fans were attacking someone and like misgendering them. And that's, that's gross and disgusting. Um, yesterday I wasn't including that because I knew about it and I was just trying to be team Sarah. I didn't know about it. So I always love to be informed about more stuff I didn't know or another opinion or a take in the comments or like that person who emailed me. It just, all you have to do is just be respectful about it. Be nice about it. We don't have to agree. I love hearing opinions because I am not always right or correct. Maybe I interpret it wrong. Maybe I didn't understand why the conversation started. Always feel free, please, to be like, hey, I think you might've missed this or actually this or give your opinion. I'd love to hear it in the comments or you can email me or you can DM me. I'm always open to conversations. Just please be respectful. And that was an issue I had a few weeks ago that people were expressing their opinions with. You have every right, but they were being really nasty about it and I don't have time for that, okay? Um, we're in the middle of a global parallelogram, so I don't have time for nasty comments. But if you wanna be nice, I'm, I'm here for it. Anything that I can link is in the description box around as well as links to my social media, links to causes that are going on in the world and ways you can help, ways to support my channel. Uh, I'm very tired. My mouth is dry. I'm gonna go eat, but thanks for watching. I'll see you in my next one. Bye. Voices hashtag. They seldom get it because in part of vicious stereotypes about how Jews control the media, there's also a sort of model minority situation where because a lot of people in publishing are Jewish, maybe they think we have enough rep. So we are let left out of pitch of it hey are you still there you still hey you still there okay i don't have a physical copy of it but it's on the way but everyone read root magic by eden royce have you read it yet have you read it yet okay he hasn't read it yet but you need it read read root magic by eden royce thank you